Jesus did it. What did he do? Excellent question. If you're not sure what Jesus Christ accomplished for you by dying the painful death that he died on the cross, I would encourage you to drop down and click on the website link below and you can read for yourself what he did for you. I'm going to share just a little bit. Some people like to listen rather than read. And so I'm going to just share a few highlights of what Jesus accomplished for humanity by dying on the cross when he didn't have to. That's one of the first things that many people have not heard about Christianity. And, uh, you know, they've, they've, they've heard a lot of things said about Jesus Christ, the Bible, Christianity, but a lot of it is just half-truths, part-truths, and I've found that many people have made judgments and formed beliefs on things that are really not so not true, in other words. See, the Bible says that we were all born with the sinful nature of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, it says in the Bible, were the first two created people on this planet. And God walked with them daily. They had uh, contact with God somehow, some way, evidently, eyeball to eyeball. And uh, he had told them uh, that they could eat of any thing there was to eat of in the Garden of Eden, Eden with one exception, and that was from the tree of good and evil. And he said, if you eat of the fruit of that tree, you will surely die. Well, you can read for yourself where Eve got tempted. Uh, the devil or Satan appeared to her in the form of a snake. Must have been a pretty good looking snake, I suppose. Maybe all the snakes talked there. I've, I have no clue exactly how that all came down. But this this serpent, whoever he was, evidently Eve wasn't afraid of him. And he spoke some things that she liked hearing. And he said to her, well, God didn't say that. He didn't mean it literally. Uh, you're not going to die if you eat the, this fruit. And it'll make you wise. You'll know some things you didn't know otherwise. So he lied to her and enticed her to eat of that fruit. She ate of it, and then uh, the Bible says that she uh, somehow was persuasive and talking uh, Adam into eating it too. And sure enough, neither one of them dropped over dead. So uh, in the near future, they assumed what the serpent had said was true. They didn't die. Well, they found out that God did, didn't explain all of what he was getting at when he said, surely if you eat this fruit, you're going to die. They lost intimacy with God. Because of their disobedience, God, who has stated in the Old Testament portion of the Bible that he cannot stand to be in the presence of disobedience to him. He's an all-righteous, all-holy God, and he will not tolerate sin or disobedience to him to be in his presence, not in his full presence. And so he departed, and they were on their own. And uh, they began to experience emotions that they had never experienced before. Uh, they experienced separation from God. Eventually, they ended up dying physically. And so what God had promised them did come to pass. And so because they sinned against God, all of the offspring that came from them, they inherited a, the sinful nature from Adam and Eve. And so their offspring produced offspring right down to you and I today. And we were born with that sinful nature we inherited somehow from Adam and Eve's disobedience to God. So we're all born sinners, it says in the Bible, in the New Testament Bible. And God has said the wages of sin are death, same to us. And we say, well, that's a bum rap. Well, God is the one who said it, so it's like either you believe it or don't believe it. And uh, I'm not trying to persuade anybody to believe it or disbelieve it. It's just that if you have not heard 
why Jesus needed to go to the cross and pay the penalty for our sins. It makes no sense to people who hear that. And uh, that's what this is all about, is to help people hear more clearly why Jesus Christ uh, went to the cross and paid the penalty for all of our sins. We were born sinners, and we were born separated from God. That's why we question, is God real? Who is God? What do I believe about God? Satan has interjected so much uh, counterfeit truth to humanity, it is near maddening to try to come to some realization of what do I believe about spiritual truth? What do I believe about God? What do I believe about the Bible? What do I believe about what somebody else is teaching? As though it's what I'm supposed to believe. That's why it's so difficult for us to get a... uh, in contact or communion with God like Adam and Eve once had before they sinned against God. So our sin separates us from God. It will separate us from God for all eternity if something isn't done about our sin. Jesus says, aha, I'll be your savior. I will be the one who will make a way for you to be right with God So your sins are not only forgiven by God, but you will have uh, the ability, because of what I'm doing for you, to be in direct contact with God. He will hear your prayers. He will answer them as much as he will answer the prayers of anybody else who have reached out and grabbed a hold of this free gift of eternal salvation that Jesus Christ secured for every person on this planet. Let me say it this way. This makes it a little more understandable for some people. Let's say Jesus Christ is a lawyer. Let's say you were guilty of killing at least one person. And you did that out of anger. Uh, You know you probably should not have done that. Uh, It says in the Old Testament, in the Ten Commandments, one of the Old Testament commandments, Thou shalt not kill. And if you killed somebody because of your anger, that's a sin. Now, if you killed a a person who's trying to harm you and you were guiltless in that, that's not a sin that God's going to hold against you. God does expect us to protect ourselves, our family, our loved ones, and sometimes protecting somebody else from dying. So that's not a sin that God will hold against us. But when we willfully murder somebody, that is a sin that God says it must uh, be forgiven. And the only way that we can receive that forgiveness is through what Jesus Christ did for us. Okay, but who is Jesus Christ that he would be qualified to be our lawyer? If we were in that courtroom and the judge hears all the evidence and it is clearly obvious to the judge and to the jury that we engaged ourselves in premeditated murder and we're gonna be sentenced to die for that or we might be sentenced to lifetime in prison and then die in prison. Imagine Jesus Christ being our lawyer. All the evidence has been presented And now the judge is going to pronounce sentence, and it's not going to be fun to hear what the judge is going to say. Jesus says, Your Honor, I have something that I would like to say before you pronounce judgment on my client. Obviously, my client is guilty, guilty of uh, being put to death in payment for the sin she or he committed or going to life in prison, whatever the state may have, wherever, you know, they are living at the time, wherever this is unfolding. And Jesus says, Your Honor, I have a request. I want to take the punishment for my client so that my client can go free and have a good life from here going forward. I want to die in the place of my client. So kill me, persecute, not persecute, uh, Pour out your wrath upon me for the sin of my client. Or send me to prison and let me spend the rest of my life in prison and then knowing I will die there. So my client can go free. Can you imagine a lawyer doing such a thing? No, none of us can. Well, that's exactly what Jesus Christ did for each and every one of us by dying on the cross. He paid the penalty for all of our past, 
present and future sins that we have yet to commit before we die. That's what he accomplished on the cross. Well, what made him the acceptable sacrifice that God the Father would accept? Well, the Bible says that Jesus was tempted to sin like every person ever has or will be tempted to sin, yet never gave in to any of those temptations. And so Jesus lived his entire life of about 33 years, uh, never sinning once. And that made him the only human being who has never sinned one time. Had he sinned one time, his sacrifice would not have been acceptable to God the Father. But because he never sinned, that made him the only human being who has ever been qualified to have God the Father accept that sacrifice. And so God the Father dumped all of his anger and wrath onto Jesus Christ. He took the sins of every person upon himself so that we might go free. That is your lawyer. He's our mediator. He restored our right relationship again with God when nothing else would restore it. We can have our sins forgiven immediately if we ask Jesus Christ to Forgive us, forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our sins are immediately not only forgiven by God, but blotted out in God's mind. That's incredible. And so any future sin that we commit, if we will confess that to God, ask forgiveness for it, we are immediately forgiven for all of our future sins. What Bible scripture proves that? 1 John 1, 9. It covers all sin that we will ever commit, have committed, will commit in this lifetime. And so Jesus absorbed all of the wrath of God on himself when he did not have to. He demonstrated his love for sinners, you and I, and everybody else. He went to the grave. After three days in the grave, he arose Sin couldn't keep him in the grave. The devil couldn't keep him in the grave. He resurrected from the dead to the newness of life and in due season went back to be where he came from in heaven, in his place of the Godhead. So my friend, that's essentially what God accomplished for us by sending Jesus to earth to live and die for the explicit purposes of enabling us to have our sins against God forgiven, to be in right standing with him so they won't be held against us now and more importantly on the judgment day. You see, on the judgment day, there's going to be two categories of people, only two categories of people. Those whose sins were forgiven because they had asked Jesus to be their Savior and Lord before they died, and those who didn't ask Jesus to forgive them of all of their sins and make him Savior and Lord of their lives. Those people will give an account of all their sins to God on the judgment day, and they will receive the sentence due for all of those sins. The Bible tells us that their punishment will be eternal separation from God. There will no longer be any opportunity to be forgiven of those sins. And they must pay eternity for all eternity for all of the sins they ever committed. Whereas the saved Christians who asked Jesus to be Savior and Lord of them before they died, their sins will not even be brought up on the judgment day. As a matter of fact, they will be rewarded for what they did after they become saved, born-again Christians. I won't go off into that because that's a whole other teaching in and of itself. So my friend, the wisest thing any of us can do is make it our number one aim to find out truly what Jesus Christ did for us and what are we going to do about it? I can only tell you that I lived 35 years of my life so confused, so addicted to doubt and unbelief that Satan had injected me with, I didn't care 
whether there's a heaven or a hell or a judgment day. I didn't care what the Bible had to say. I, you know, Jesus Christ was one of my favorite swear words, and that's as far as I thought it about it, sadly. And had God not brought me down, humbled me to the point where I was begging for him to make himself real to me as to what I should believe before dying, because I was going to commit suicide of sorts, okay? God miraculously revealed himself to me after much agony. And I found out supernaturally by revelation from God who Jesus Christ is and was. Now, it took me some time to get fuller revelation of who he is and was and what was accomplished for me on the cross, but I knew he was the one I was to connect to based on what he did, nothing I did. And so I, I tell everybody, as of this taping, that's 33, 34 years ago, and I owe God. The reason I'm talking to anybody on this camera right now is because I owe God. I owe God everything because he spared me from going to hell, whereas I would have to pay the penalty for all of my sins. So, yeah, I all owe him. Truth be known, we all owe him. He didn't have to send Jesus to come to this earth. He did not have to save any of us from the penalty for our sins. But he offers it as a free gift to humanity. Won't be around forever, but it's available now. And the wisest thing I can encourage anybody is to make it their number one goal in life. Number one prayer they need to be praying. God, show me who Jesus is. Give me a revelation of what he accomplished for me by dying on the cross for me when he didn't have to. It was the greatest demonstration of love God could have ever given humanity. It cost him everything. Salvation is free for us. It cost God everything. It cost him his own life with a great amount of suffering that came with it. Again, I encourage you to check that website link out below. Uh, it might probably articulate what I've been trying to say to you better, and you can, you can read that. And uh, thanks for giving me the time to share uh, really what Jesus did. Uh, this is essentially the message of the cross. Jesus is the message of the cross. God bless you.